everyone. Um, we are slowly making a move. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Tobias Denskos. I'm a senior lecturer in communication for development, which most of our students obviously know. But I know we have a few external visitors today, so I will just take the opportunity, obviously, to welcome them as well and maybe um, give a very quick um, explanation what is happening here. Um, you see the cameras in the room. Um, the event will be uh, live streamed and live broadcasted. We have a group of about 20 to 30 of our online students um, joining us um, online, virtually. Um, and this is kind of a regular teaching setup in our Communication for Development Master's programs that we have been running now for pretty much 20 years. Um, and this time for this afternoon session, we teamed up with our colleagues from Media and Communication Studies and MEDEA, um, and we um, asked Kate Wright to join us. And I think um, Kate's work um, really brings together these kind of three elements, obviously, uh, background in journalism and media and communication studies, but she's also, um, her work with the um, African Journalism Project um, also shed some interesting lights on the work that Medea does in terms of creative industries, um, how journalism in general is changing, how funding for journalism is changing, different actors, new forms of journalism emerging. And last but not least is obviously also at the heart of what we are doing in communication for development, humanitarian communication, um, and work around global development. Um, some of the students will recognize Kate's name. She is part of a team together with uh, Mel Bunce and Martin Scott, um, who is just finishing up a larger research project on humanitarian journalism, and Kate will talk about that a little bit more. Um, Martin Scott's book, Media and Development, is on our reading list. Um, so this is sort of the, the, the core team um, that has been doing tremendous work on uh, media, media development and humanitarian journalism uh, in the last few years. Um, welcome, Kate Wright. Hello, everyone. Um, can you hear me okay at the back? Um, I just want to start off by saying it's a great honor to be here. I've admired Tobias's work for a long time on peace building and, and communication. Um, but we mainly communicate via Twitter, so it's actually nice to physically meet, although this is the first time I'm meeting a whole load of new people. Hello, new people online. <laughs> this is the first time I've been live streamed, so I hope I do this OK. Um, I'm the academic lead at the Media and Communications Research Cluster at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and as Tobias mentioned, uh, I've been working recently with two colleagues, uh, Mel Bunce and Martin Scott, on the Humanitarian Journalism Project. Uh, I've just put the website there for the moment. All the publications there are free to view. They're not behind any subscription paywalls. So those of you working in industry, feel free to go on. I'll also pass around some of the industry reports that have come out of that to see if it interests you. But mostly today, what I'm going to be talking about is my monograph um, called Who's Reporting Africa Now? Um, because I know that many of you are students, I brought some money off vouchers. If I could pass those around, mm -hmm. Hugo. Mm -hmm. If anybody wants the book, that's 30% off. Just if you do, no pressure. And it's the book of my PhD. So do we have any PhD students in the room or online? No? If you want to ask about the process of turning a PhD into a book, we can maybe talk a little bit more about that later. So what's the book about? The book focuses on NGOs production of multimedia. And by multimedia, I mean photographs, videos, and other kinds of interactive, often quite sophisticated, multimedia for placement in mainstream news. So I'm not talking about NGOs putting out their own news by social media. I'm talking about NGOs placing material in mainstream news. And it's a phenomenon that started to become common around the mid-2000s. Um, it's now absolutely routine in most major NGOs. So here's a quote to get you started from Kimberly Abbott, who's herself an NGO worker, who says, a decade ago when I was a journalist, it was rare to find an NGO communications officer in the field. 
that role was an afterthought for many organizations and was left to overstretched field staff who were not trained in media parlance. And I know because I used to get, try and get sound bites from some of them. Today, NGO communications experts are posted around the world, tweeting, photographing, producing video documentaries, creating mapping tools, blogging, and supplementing news coverage. NGOs have adapted to and become part of the new media ecology. So I want to talk initially about why this has come to pass, and then we'll go on to talk about some more about the relevance of this to the coverage of sub-Saharan Africa. A good way to start to think about this is to think about intersecting political economies. Let's think first of all about aid workers' side. Aid workers, as many of you know, are experiencing a dramatic increase in need. I don't know if anyone's here read the UN OCHA report that was out at the back of last year, but conflict, um, the increased fragility of states, climate change, all of these things are combining to prolong crises to the point when many crises have just become the state of affairs. It's hard to distinguish between the crisis and normality because the crisis has become the new normal. Aid agencies are experiencing a dramatic funding shortfall. The numbers of people needing help has soared in the last few years, but funding has not kept pace with that. Uh, UN Orchard's figures, well, that's interesting. Uh, well, they had, they had a, a huge funding gap that they still haven't managed to, to plug. Now, there is a, a positive correlation between the amount of positive news coverage that aid agencies get and increase in public donations. So aid agencies have an obvious motivation to try and increase positive news coverage of their activities in order to raise more money. That's a fairly straightforward cause and effect. They also have a normative wish to educate the public about suffering that's happening a long way away, and a belief that they gain legitimacy with political actors if they are in the media a lot. If they are perceived to be shaping news discourse, there's a knock-on effect, they believe, in terms of how often they're invited in to address parliaments or other national assemblies. What other causal factors are there shaping aid agencies' participation in news? Well, communications technology is a lot cheaper than it used to be. It's a lot easier to learn than it used to be. And there is a general social shift whereby people like me, former journalists, picture editors, filmmakers, are gradually being uh, recruited by aid agencies. So there's been, as there have been increasing redundancies in news organizations, many of those very skilled personnel have moved over to NGOs. So there's quite a few driving factors here on aid agencies' side. What's going on for news organizations? Have we got any former journalists in the audience, apart from me and Hugo? Does this strike a chord at all, this picture? What's happening with journalists? There is a dramatic speeding up of the news cycle. Once upon a time, what now feels like a very, very distant time in the past, your program went out once a day. Your newspaper went out once a day. With satellite TV and now with the internet, the news cycle isn't really a cycle at all. It's constant. You're constantly refreshing. You also tend to be reversioning the same material for different platforms. My former colleagues at the BBC not only work for radio, they also do television pieces, they do online pieces, they're expected to have a social media presence. So they're serving many different platforms at once. For commercial news organizations, particularly in the West, they've lost a lot of money. There's been a drop in advertising revenue a drop in cover sales or subscriptions. People don't expect to pay for their news anymore. But there are also some problems that are experienced by other kinds of news organizations. For example, Al Jazeera gets a significant amount of funding from uh, Qatar, the state. But there's been a fall in oil prices, which mean their budgets have been cut as well. 
So what we've seen is widespread cost cutting in Western news organizations and some other news organizations as well. Notably not Chinese news organizations, they're a bit different. And I can talk about them in questions if you'd like. So what does that mean on the ground? That means reductions in newsroom staff, reductions in correspondent posts, reductions in international bureaus and travel budgets. And the things that get hit most are non-elite countries, which are not news leads very often. So there's a disproportionate amount of cost cutting happening in what we might call developing countries. So we've got aid agencies needing more coverage, and we've got journalists desperately needing some help with obtaining that coverage. These two things are coming together. So the model is often described as the hamster on a wheel of journalists going faster and faster and faster with less and less and less. But that's not actually, strictly speaking, accurate. Yes, journalists are expected to do more with less, but they're also doing journalism differently. One of the best studies of this is by Sweden's own Henrik Ernebring, who's up at Karlstadt, who talks about the way in which the changes in journalism, the way in which cost cutting has been carried out, has privileged role merging. So when you used to have three people all doing different jobs, now you have one person doing all three jobs. Multi-skilling, not specialism. And what he calls the reorganization of journalistic work. Some things have been folded in to journalists' daily workload, like publication, and some things are being outsourced to other people. We'll come back to what that means later. So what does any of this have to do with Africa? A lot of the arguments about the movement of NGO workers into journalism, whether that's in terms of NGO workers being recruited, sorry, journalists being recruited by NGOs, or in terms of NGO workers placing material in news outlet, those kinds of critical conversations have tended to revolve around the coverage of Africa. <coughs> Africa comes up over and over and over again. If you look on the Frontline Club videos, which are available online, Frontline is kind of a, a correspondence club in London and New York. Every time practitioners discuss this, which is pretty regularly, um, Africa is at the forefront of their discussions. Why? Why Africa? Why not mm, Southeast Asia? Why not, I don't know, Latin America? Why are we coming back to Africa all the time? A lot of that is because the news about sub-Saharan Africa, and when people talk about Africa, they're not generally talking about North Africa. They're normally talking about sub-Saharan countries, which is in itself problematic, and we can talk about later. It's believed to be particularly bad. Not just bad, awful, actually. It's widely believed to be absolutely dreadful. Sporadic, decontextualized, full of stereotypes, driven by crises, and very, very negative. And that's a view echoed by numerous studies going right the way back to Beverly Hawke's seminal book from 1992, Africa's Media Image. So a key concern is that this damages the continent. The idea that media coverage has real life implications, discourages investment, discourages self-reliance, um, creates a self-perpetuating cycle in which sub-Saharan countries are treated as basket cases, in effect, and therefore are unable to um, tap into the transnational networks that would enable them to move out of poverty. One of the ways in which this links to arguments about NGOs coverage is that there is a concern that NGOs news content entrenches these representations of the continent that are essentially imperialistic rescue narratives. Uh, established in colonial times, those of you who are familiar with imperialist era writer writing to 
that in effect legitimizes NGOs' intervention in others' affairs. So one of the key contentions is that NGOs perpetuate these very damaging negative narratives that treat sub-Saharan countries as if they're unable to help themselves, in need of uh, white northern saviors. So Jairo Lugo Kando puts this very nicely. He says, it's because of this negative crisis-driven news agenda that Western intervention has been so widely accepted, becoming, as Rudyard Kipling once put it, the white man's burden. So that has been widely accepted, that view, for 20, 30 plus years. But actually, does it hold water? I mean, whenever I say this in African studies, there is kind of a <gasps> collective gasp around the room, the idea that maybe news coverage about Africa isn't uniquely bad. How do we know, if we do know, that news coverage about Africa is uniquely bad. Um, PhD students in the room, take note, the people with whom you have coffees now and discussions with now will feed your intellectual life for decades to come. I got to know Martin Scott when I was doing a PhD and he was doing his PhD and we corresponded online. And I was often whinging to Martin, frankly, that I was, I was doing my literature review chapter uh, and all of it was about how uniquely dreadful uh, news coverage of Africa was. And honestly, as, as a former journalist, I found a lot of this literature offensive because it didn't differentiate between different kinds of media representations. And that seemed to me as a former journalist mad. Fox News is not Al Jazeera. The Daily Mail tabloid is not the New York Times. How can we talk about the media as if it is one thing? I knew many journalists who were working desperately hard to do good coverage of Africa, often in very difficult circumstances. So I'd often be whinging to Martin about this and say, look, I, I'm doing this literature review all about how dreadful news coverage of Africa is, and I, I don't buy it. And these are the greats. These are people who have had standing in my field for 30 plus years. And I'm not sure they're right. And he said, do you know what? I'm really interested in that. Would you mind terribly if I did a scoping review of literature and I had a look at all of these studies of Africa and tested whether we have enough knowledge to actually make that generalized judgment that news about Africa is uniquely bad? And I said, no, I'd love it if you did that, please. Go ahead, do that study. I want to see the results. Because I didn't know if it was just my wounded pride as a former journalist, or actually if I was onto something. So Martin, who is a man who likes spreadsheets, uh, went off and made a magnificent, truly impressive spreadsheet of all of the academic literature and the gray literature, which is reports by, by think tanks and so on, on UK, and US representations of Africa from 1990 to 2014. That was quite a big spreadsheet. And he found out something that confirmed my hunch. First of all, that there are remarkably few systematic studies of the coverage of Africa longitudinal studies that look at a variety of different kinds of media representations. There's a very narrow range of studies on particular kinds of media. There are lots on newspapers, because they're quite easy to get hold of, aren't they? You can get a database of newspaper coverage or magazine coverage. There's very little on broadcast. You can get some coverage on television, but there is one study on radio, and that's mine. <laughs> so there's, there's a very narrow range of different kinds of media. There's a very narrow range of studies on particular events. Scholars keep coming back to the same events over and over and over again, and generalizing on the basis of those studies. Now, what's really interesting is the kinds of events that they keep coming back to, 
are incredibly negative. The genocide, for example, in Rwanda in 1994, the military crisis in Darfur. So in effect, what Martin proved is that scholars, researchers, are doing exactly the same thing that they accuse journalists of doing. They're taking a very, very small number of extremely negative cases and generalizing about the coverage of Africa, a whole continent, on the basis of those incredibly narrow range of cases. So we can't say that coverage of Africa is actually quite good. What we can say is that we don't know. The studies have yet to be done. So if you're looking for an area to research, there you go. We don't have enough detailed, systematic studies to tell you what media coverage of Africa is like. So I can't actually say, does NGO material make it better or worse, because we don't have a baseline, really, to go on. We thought we did for 30 years, but actually, we didn't. While Martin was doing this incredibly valuable work, I was starting to stroke my chin a bit too and think about, hmm, in what other ways do academics overgeneralize about this kind of area? Most of the work on NGOs' contribution to news coverage is on the basis of aid agencies. But eight agencies, they're only one kind of NGO. If you look at the UN's definition, there are many, many different kinds of NGOs. NGOs include trade unions. They include feminist groups. They include climate change groups. They include cooperatives. And I thought, that's very interesting. I have never read a study, when I first started, there are now a few more, about NGOs' engagement in journalism that's not about an aid agency. That seems to be quite a big blind spot to me. Whenever there are studies of NGOs' engagement in news journalism, there's very little production work. It's usually on the basis of, of a textual analysis, quite a narrow range of texts as well. So there doesn't seem to be much of an understanding of different media genre, different audiences, different organizations, um, different African countries. There was a lack of differentiation there. And there was a particularly strong focus on emergency appeals. Particularly big fundraising appeals. Now, in the UK, there is a specific um, scene, if you like, or set of structures that come into play. There's what's called the Disasters Emergency Committee, DEC. And that's an umbrella body uh, to which all of the major British aid agencies who work in um, humanitarian work belong. So they don't compete against one another when there is a crisis. They raise money together. And the DEC has a formal agreement with British-based broadcasters, which are also global giants, some of them, the BBC, Sky. They even have an informal gentleman's agreement with Al Jazeera, which has a, a base in London, that during the first few days of an appeal, those broadcasters will broadcast a message, often a celebrity-fronted message, to raise money. But there's also an understanding, although it's not a formal part of the agreement, that those organizations will give preferential treatment to aid agencies during those first few days of an appeal. So this is not just a British thing, although the effect starts in Britain, because these broadcasters are global, some of them, and journalists follow other journalists, there is a ripple effect, particularly because the DEC is one of the major members of the Emergency Appeals Alliance, which is an international organization, which has got a chapter in Sweden, I believe. 
and in many other places in the world. Now, previously, those other members of the Emergency Appeals Alliance used to start a fundraising appeal when the DEC started. Now they're starting to do their own thing a little bit more, but they will have their own arrangements with national broadcasters. So there's an interesting thing here. How much, I wondered, can one generalize about NGOs' engagement in journalism based on these kinds of appeals? Because during these kinds of appeals, number one, you'd expect aid agencies to be at the forefront. Number two, you'd expect particular kinds of imagery to be at the forefront because it's about raising money. And what raises money? Pictures of starving children. I'm really sorry, it's awful, it shouldn't work. I don't want it to work, but it does. So if we're expecting, if we're looking at those kinds of periods, we will find rescue narratives because that's what those kinds of appeal periods are for, to get you to put your hand in your pocket and give money. So looking at all of those three things, I thought there were three different kinds of generalization going on. <clears throat> NGOs are not synonymous with aid agencies. There are lots of different kinds of NGOs. The news media is not one thing. It is many things. And we can't generalize based on emergency appeal periods either, because there are particular sorts of times when you would expect particular kinds of actors and particular kinds of practices to come to the forefront. So I had a problem, in other words, with the way in which scholars were approaching this whole area, which was slightly embarrassing, because as a PhD student, I felt rather arrogant. But never mind. Now. So I decided I needed to do a different kind of research from the one that had been done before. Um, you may have come across this book, Suzanne Frank's Reporting Disasters. Again, very much um, comes up with the hypothesis that aid agencies dominate the coverage of Africa based on her analysis of the 1984 Ethiopian famine appeal. And I thought, well, this is interesting. It's an interesting hypothesis, but I don't think you can prove or disprove that based on the kind of appeal period you've looked at. But then I had a problem, and it was a methodological problem. If I'm not going to look at an emergency appeal period, what could I look at that would give me a contrast to that? There isn't such a thing as a normal news period or an average, an everyday news period. If you tried to pick one, something would probably happen in the middle of it. So what did I do instead? I picked a really quiet news week, hence my tumbleweed. I picked, journalists, can you guess, when is the quietest, most difficult period of the year for news? August. Sorry? August. August, spot on. August 2012, you should have been my supervisor. <laughs> Thank you. So I looked at a period, there were no parliaments in session. There were no conferences. There were no big diplomatic visits. The news prospects, which the spreadsheet of what's coming up, were blank. It was one of those periods that my former editor used to say to me, Kate, we're going to be creative today <laughs> because there's nothing there. So I thought that's interesting. This might be a period that strongly contrasts with an emergency period. Perhaps during that kind of a period, I might find different sorts of NGOs coming forward, different sorts of maybe alternative news frames, maybe different sorts of countries. That will be interesting. And I systematically analyzed all of the TV, radio, online and print news about Africa, which is readily available to UK audiences. That was a long month. <laughs> um, and I looked carefully to see how much NGO content was used and which topics and which organizations were involved. And often that was quite difficult because half of the stuff that I found wasn't attributed. It didn't say this was donated by Oxfam or this was uh, donated by the World Development Movement. 
or war on want. A lot of the time it was looking to see, oh, that doesn't tell me who it's from. I'll put in some calls. Oh, that tells me a person's name, but they're not a staff member. Who are they? I'll put in some calls. There's a bit of maybe investigative work there to establish which news items actually contained NGA content. And it turned out that Suzanne was partially right. It is mainly aid agencies, even outside of emergency appeals. Most of this news, the topic is people displaced by crises. So there are dominant topics as well, but not exclusively so. There's some other stuff going on as well. And it's not what Suzanne Frank suggests, that journalists are somehow blindly trusting in aid agencies. There's all sorts of other things going on. So the book, which you're free to pass around and have a look and take the money off voucher from if you wish, um, looks at five contrasting production case studies. And by a production case study, what I did was I interviewed between an hour to two hours, semi-structured interview with everyone who made a decision within the particular production of the news item I was looking at. Um, that could be a fixer, an interpreter, a field worker, a journalist, an, aid, an NGO worker, their managers, their managers' managers, or anyone else who was involved. And that rationale was because I wanted to get outside of the newsrooms and the press offices in the north. I wanted to know what do field workers in Mali have to contribute to this? What does uh, an interpreter in South Sudan contribute to this? How are their perspectives and practices different? So I was looking to find out how and why NGOs produce content for mainstream news and how and why journalists are using it. So looking at both sides of that. I ended up with about 60 semi-structured interviews. Um, I paired that with multimodal texture analysis, which means I was looking at both the written text and the pictures and the video and how they complement or are sometimes in tension with one another, and the underlying political economies. Um, in order to take quite an unusual approach to media studies. Normally we're in silos, aren't we? We look at texts, or we look at media production, or we look at media reception. I quite like breaking that. Um, and I, I picked production case studies, some of which bore out dominant trends, and some of which bucked those trends, were, were not what I expected to find, were surprising as a way of developing some generalizable theory. So what did I find? OK, Erna Bring was onto something <laughs> in the sense that he was talking about the reorganization of journalistic work. Because one of the ways in which journalistic work is being reorganized is that there is a squeezing out and outsourcing of specialism. Two particular kinds of specialism that have a bearing on this sort of work. Number one, there are very few people left in most mainstream Anglophone news organizations now who are specialists on particular non-elite countries. If you want to be a specialist in Chad, it is unlikely you have a staff job at a news organization anymore. Those people are being squeezed out. If you want to be a specialist in a particular kind of media, especially photojournalism, you've probably been squeezed out as well. So there's particular kinds of reorganization of journalistic work going on. But this is a big problem, because what's happened to news? Most of it's moved online these days. What do news online journalists need? Several things they kept telling me were a problem. They need to appear global, because they've got to capture overseas audiences. How do you do that if you've squeezed out your geographic specialists? You need to differentiate your output from others in what's a fiercely competitive market now. How do you do that if what you're doing is reversioning material, often from the wires, um, which is the same as the news organization down the street? Online audiences have terribly short attention spans. Goldfish look like they've got really good concentration by comparison. 
So how do you get the attention of an online audience who might be flicking through Twitter, they might be sending a message home to say they're going to be late for their tea to their husband. They might be looking at Facebook. They could be doing all sorts of other things online. How do you get their attention for your news outlet? It's through visuals. Online journalism is intensely visual. So online journalists need a lot of visuals. There's usually an internal policy that as you scroll down on the page, there is always something visual in sight because just blank text, pretty uninviting. They need a lot of them. And they need to be really sophisticated and distinctive. They need to look different from the other news outlets. So they've got two unique problems, haven't they? They need to seem global and they need to differentiate their output. They need a lot of pictures and they need really high quality, striking, technically sophisticated pictures. But they've just fired all their photojournalists and their geographic specialists. Oh. So journalism is facing a particular set of difficulties that NGOs are now helping them, inverted commas, to fix. So what does that mean for the coverage of Africa? Well, I've talked about how the cuts have gone deepest in most news organizations in non-elite countries. So that's not all of sub-Saharan Africa. We're still seeing quite a lot of coverage coming out about Kenya and South Africa, but not so much on Lesotho these days, or CAR, for example. Um, so one would expect to find, logically, given the intersection of those factors, that NGO material would be found more in the coverage of Africa. Does that mean, therefore, go back to this question that we're seeing this, this rescue narrative coming back, that it's damaging coverage of Africa? Well, what I found really, really surprised me. Some of the news items which had the most progressive effects were what we might call negative news. So for example, this one was an investigative report carried by, out by a British uh, TV channel called Channel 4 News, which used some video footage gathered by Human Rights Watch to prove that this man, Bosco Ntaganda, was at a very famous scene of a massacre in a place called Kawanja in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. So they disproved a lie. And Taganda is now facing trial in the International Criminal Court. Now, what everyone thinks about the International Criminal Court, disproving a lie is usually seen as a good thing in journalism. That's a worthy purpose f to which uh, news can serve. There were lots of problems with that piece as well. So we're talking about mixed effects. But the important thing I thought was that negative news about Africa is not necessarily bad news about Africa in the sense that it is harmful. It can have some progressive effects. Conversely, the other way around, this was uh, a shot from the most positive piece of news. Uh, and actually, it, it went nuts. The story appeared in the Washington Post, Al Jazeera um, English, BBC, the British paper, The Observer. And it was about an organization called the Kenyan, uh, Kenyan Paraplegic Organization, which is one of the sub-Saharan NGOs who I found did manage to get material in. And this news story was based on the idea that this man, Sakamoto, was going to go from Nairobi to South Africa. He was going to wheel himself from Kenya to South Africa to raise money to build a paraplegic clinic outside Nairobi. And the idea was that you could track him via um, GPS. He was tweeting all the time. There were videos of him. It was technically very, very sophisticated. And it appeared in all these international news outlets as uh, Africans helping themselves. It was empowering peace. And it was about mobile phones, so it tapped into all these Africa rising narratives, which I expect you've heard about. The audience were expected to give via M-Pesa, which is a cash transfer platform, 
so that Zach, who's this guy, would not have to go all the way to Johannesburg. So the campaign was called the Bring Zach Back Home campaign. Bring him home. He doesn't have to go all the way to Joburg. Bring him home. Give enough so that paraplegics can be treated in Nairobi. Has anyone spotted the problems with this yet? Anyone remotely familiar with the geography of Africa? There's a hand going on. How far apart are Nairobi and Joburg? Yes, that pretty much says it. Um, around 4,000 kilometers. What's the conditions of the roads between Nairobi and Johannesburg? Not so good. Um, I have friends who are paraplegics. They often get tired, as you would, doing this all day. Nairobi, Johannesburg. Let's think about that for a minute. Was that ever going to happen? No. But what's interesting was that northern journalists lost their minds over this. It was a positive story about Africa. We're getting away from negative stereotypes. They don't have the nasty, suspicious mind that I do, obviously. So what I found out, first of all, was that there were no plans to ever cross over the border from Kenya. There were no fundraising licenses. There were no visas. There were no travel permits. There was no logistics team. I'm a former event manager, and I did a lot of outside broadcasts for the BBC. I'm sorry. Nairobi, Johannesburg, no logistics team? Really? So at this point, I started becoming even more suspicious. And I found out that the reason why the media coverage was so sophisticated of this, I mean, GPS and Twitter and videos, was that it was being supported by Safaricom. And Safaricom is one of the biggest telecommunications companies in sub-Saharan Africa, which owns M-Pesa. So what we have here is a really interesting phenomenon, kind of product placement within a fundraising campaign. Um, what we might call perhaps a new kind of brand aid, where rather than selling shoes or wristbands or concert tickets for good, the product itself, the commercial product, is marketed by being placed within the fundraising campaign. Also, when I started digging a bit deeper, I realized that this campaign was launched um, as part of a corporate social responsibility project run by Safaricom in the immediate af aftermath of an international fraud scandal. In addition, the NGO had quite explicit political links to ODM, which is one of the parties in Kenya. And this was six months before the election. And the head of NGO had already, by that point, decided that he wanted to campaign for election in that parliament. He's now um, one of the members of parliament for Westlands, which is a particularly um, prosperous suburb of Nairobi. But perhaps most importantly, there were never any plans to run the clinic either. Yes, I know. Um, it's a cliche amongst development. They call them, has anyone heard the phrase mongos before? My own little NGO, which um, comes from the child's toy, My Little Pony. The idea is that we're going to build stuff. Most people will give money to build stuff because it's tangible, right? To build a thing that was not there before is tangible. But how are you going to staff it? Who's going to pay the ongoing costs, like electricity? How are you going to get people to that clinic? There isn't currently a road there, which is a problem for anybody, let alone a person in a wheelchair. So when I was last in Nairobi, I went to go and see this clinic. Um, it's half built. It's covered in weeds. It's quite obviously no one's been there for a long time. And the head of the NGO is now a member of the Kenyan parliament. So I don't, want to, um, I don't want to run foul of libel laws here, so just read into that what you will. Um, but I think we can say that that was maybe not as progressive as it appeared to be as a news story. Can I just quickly ask, was there ever news? That's a really good question, really good question. The Standard in Kenya did do a follow-up piece on it which didn't go anywhere, which tells me something about the kinds of appetite for positive news about Africa. Mm -hmm. 
there is amongst international media. Um, Northern journalists, I think, are oversteering. They've, they've done negative stereotypes so long, they're trying really hard to go the other way, and they're going so far that they don't properly research what appear to be light, positive stories, nice little features. They, d they think they're just straightforward. OK, so another key finding. So negative and positive stories, I think we can treat those as quite problematic terms now, because a positive story about Africa is not necessarily progressive. A negative news story about Africa is not necessarily damaging and harmful, or not 100% anyway. The other key finding was that you can't really conceptualize NGO journalist relations as binary. A lot of the work on this before I got started is based on the golden age of media sociology, which is the 1970s. It's based on the idea of journalist source relations. But we've gone a long way past the period when journalists had jobs for life in their organizations. And NGO workers had jobs for life. And so they sat in their very separate organizations in their jobs for life. That is not what's happening. There were exchanges taking place all the time via third parties, particularly freelancers, who did a contract for one, then sold the material on to another. Maybe did a trip doing commissions for both news organizations and non-governmental organizations at the same time. This is a very different model, isn't it? This casualization from a period where you're sitting there in your staff job and you're picking the phone up to your counterpart in the other organization. A very different model. So I found that there is a small pool of usually American and European freelancers who are specialists, who want to specialize in particular African countries, or they want to specialize in photojournalism, and they found themselves squeezed out of news organizations for one reason or another. And they work in this liminal way in between the two. And that's really interesting ethically for all sorts of reasons, because there is no hard boundary for them between NGO work and journalism. But it's also quite interesting artistically, um, because what we've come to think of as being typical forms of NGO imagery, poverty porn, or um, the smiling child development kind of <coughs> cliches. That's not what was happening. What was happening was kind of a, a hybridization of aesthetic forms. A lot of the photojournalists in particular um, were very influenced by social documentary photography, works like uh, Sebastião Salgado for example, and other kinds of art forms. So this is a, a picture which was taken by Tom Pilston, who's a, quite a very well thought of photojournalist, uh, of a crisis in Mali. And Tom's really interesting, because Tom used to work for the independent newspaper. And he did this for Christian Aid. And then his pictures, which he did for Christian Aid, were sold back to the independent. So these pictures appeared in the independent where he used to be a staffer. And one of the reasons they took them because they knew Tom's work was really beautiful. So beautiful kept coming up and again. And I thought, well, what does it mean, beautiful? What is, who judges beauty? By whose standards is this beauty judged? And Tom explained to me what I was trying to do here. I was trying to get this golden light coming from the side onto um, this Quranic scholar's face and his family like, he said, old masters paintings, European, very elite style of artwork. And he thought this would give them greater dignity because it wasn't sensationalistic, stripped the bone, poverty porn. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because what we're getting here is still Western standards. It's still the Western gaze. It's still Western ideals of beauty. It's still a form of consumption the consumption, the aestheticization of someone else's suffering. But it's perhaps not the kinds of imagery we expected to come across uh, when we're thinking about NGO coverage. I mentioned to you 
ethics were interesting as well. And I, I've written quite a lot about freelancers. Freelancers fascinate me because usually there is a, those of you who do Bourdieu, you're used to thinking in terms of a boundary between different fields of activities. As someone who habitually boundary crosses for a living, how do they make sense of that? How do they um, justify that? And I found that a lot of these freelancers had been correspondents. They'd been very senior. And they'd been in countries for a very long time. And they felt a loyalty and a responsibility to people in those countries more than to their managers at head office in London or in New York. And this, was, this really interested me. This is the kind of quote they gave me. Um, this was a, a freelancer who works uh, quite a lot in, shall we say, Central Africa. And he said, I've ended up going way beyond my role as a journalist. I thought it's quite, quite interesting that he put those in inverted commas as well. Now I think maybe I am, I must be, a sort of an activist now. And I know there is a kind of school in journalism which teaches you to keep a distance, but I think somehow you are involved. And the longer you're involved, especially in one place, the more you can't deny that. And one day you just say to yourself, yes, I'm part of this now. And this freelancer was fascinating to me because I went on to say to him, was there a moment was there a moment when you thought, I've gone over that line. I'm no longer a journalist in that objective Western model sense and become an activist. Was there a boundary or was it a gradual, slow process for you? And he said, and I have to do this with the scarf um, because he's quite a, a well-polished person. Well, you know, Kate, yes, I think there was a moment. I think that moment was maybe when I helped a prisoner of conscience escape from prison. You see, I dressed in women's clothing and I drove the getaway car. I do not think this is covered in the BBC guidelines. I think uh, that's fair to say it's not. Um, but there are other ways in which our NGO workers consciously use freelancers' kind of liminal positioning to work the system. This is a clip, if it works, from Polly Markandia, who was, until recently, the head of communications at Médecins Sans Frontières. And she's describing how she uses freelancers to get material into news organisations. Our correspondents were not, were not really formally attached to a, a news outlet in the way that they're having a salary paid all the time. So they're not the correspondent, but they're a kind of stringer. So they, they regularly write for this paper or they regularly you know, feed in stories to this outlet. And they're in an area. And they're living this kind of hand-to-mouth existence where they're trying to pay the bills with a combination of work for NGOs, so I'll shoot your next you know, Mother's Day campaign, and work for, um, for broadcast outlets or, or newspapers. And this you know, brings you into this kind of world where you know, you can, they're like you know, guns for hire, almost you know, pens for hire. And you can hire them to, to, visit your, to your, visit your project. And then if you're lucky and you talk to them nicely, they'll also pitch that same story as an independent journalist into their news outlet. And that happens a lot. A lot. So this word independent is really interesting. This was one of the things that came up again and again. The myth of freelancers' independence on auto autonomy was used by NGOs to smooth the way to get their material into news outlets. And it was also used by news organizations to disavow, to deny the fact that they were taking quite a lot of material from NGOs. So I heard quite a lot of the time, oh, I, I, didn't, I don't take a lot of material from NGOs. Oh, what about this piece and that piece and that piece? Oh, I didn't take that from an NGO. I've taken that from my trusted freelancer. They're an independent freelancer. I'm not taking it from an NGO. I'm taking it from a trusted independent freelancer. So trust and this construction of independence happened a lot. Meanwhile, freelancers are going backwards and forwards like little bees, 
cross-fertilizing ways of telling stories, ways of perceiving situations between NGOs and news organizations. So it's no longer what it once was, which is the NGO press officer lifting up the phone and pitching material to the editor. Very often, it doesn't require that at all. You simply ask your freelancer to do it, or you don't even need to ask them. The fact that they need to make rent will probably suffice that they will pick up the telephone themselves so that they get a second income stream out of one commission. So that's what's happening now. That's the most interesting thing to me. So what's happening, this analogy of the bees, freelancers going backwards and forwards from flower to flower, cross-fertilizing, is that NGOs and news organizations are coming into much closer economic and actually normative alignment with one another without even realizing that they are. But the presence of freelancers means that trust between NGOs and news organizations is constructed indirectly. It's not that you will say to, for example, a BBC journalist, oh yes, Oxfam, I trust them, they know what they're doing. They won't say that, they'll say, I really trust that freelancer. The trust is constructed indirectly. But that means for the NGOs there's a problem because a lot of the time the material is accepted and attributed with the freelancer's name and not the NGO's name, which if you're trying to raise money is a problem. You don't get the branding, but you may get your material in. So how do we think about this? We've come a long way past the days where the argument was NGO material, is it a good thing or a bad thing? A bit clunky, a bit binary, a bit polarized. We've also come past this binary model of journalist source relationships, as if the journalists stay in one box and the NGOs stay in the other. The boxes have gone. Don't think in boxes anymore. That's not what's happening. Now we're looking at multiple exchanges taking place. Freelancers are crucial. I haven't had time to talk about it today, but I also nodded to advertisers, public relations experts, businesses with uh, corporate social responsibility schemes, and to some extent, social media participants. So we're looking at a network of exchanges now, not a binary exchange. So what's happening within that network? Is it network journalism? Is it we're just all collaborating and participating these days? Well, no, it's not. Because those networks, the nodes within those networks, don't have equal power. There are very definite disadvantages experienced by some people within those exchanges. So it's, if it's a network, it's one with a lot of inequalities in it. I find it easier to think about it as an economy because a lot of this stuff is about financial value. Um, but it's a financial value interacting with normative value, ideas of the good, ideas of the right or the just. So you've got financial values and normative values, both of which are really important. The freelancers in particular who do this work, they're doing it because they think it's good work. They could do something else and probably earn a lot more money from it. But the ideas of good work are really important. But the financial values and the normative values also interact with one another to change each other. So that's why I call it a moral economy, building on Andrew Sayer's work. It's one in which ideas of the good are really important, but so is cold, hard cash. And why that's important, it's a political economy as well as a moral economy, is that journalists don't just use them the material that saves them the most time and money. Given how much stress they're under, that's what you'd think would happen. You would think journalists would use vast volumes of material because it helped them get through the shift. That's not what's going on. They're actually quite selective. They pick the material that they think helps them meet their responsibilities. Responsibilities or obligations comes up again and again in relation to this idea of the good. Now that might be their conscience, their moral responsibilities as journalists. You know, journalists often get very upset and very worried that they can't cover non-elite countries. They don't have those budgets. They think it's wrong 
not just unprofessional, but morally wrong. So they're doing it for that reason. They may also have responsibilities, for example, as a public service broadcaster to provide a diverse range of, of news, and they're struggling to do that. So there are formal responsibilities and there are informal responsibilities. They're using this material to try and square the circle, to try and negotiate some very difficult tensions. So that's probably enough heavy theory for one afternoon. I will thank you now, follow up with feedback. I'd be really interested to know what you think of these ideas. So please feel free to tweet me, email me, tell me what you think. Tell me you think I'm wrong. It's always quite interesting. And I'll ask now for any questions from the floor. Anyone? <coughs> Tobias, do you want to chair or shall I? Yeah, um, I would just hand out the microphone so the audience online can just understand a little bit better. So. Hi. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, basically, this is more of an offbeat observation. Like, you see a similar um, development in academia where specialist areas of study are being pushed out due to funding. So I find it very interesting that you bring, bring in Africa. And you see the same thing in the Africa Studies Department at SOAS, for instance, where the new director um, gets more money in her paycheck than what the department gets for research funding. Um, I, I, it's just as a point, it's um, a very interesting thing to think about, maybe. I think you're not far <laughs> wrong. Uh, I, I'm moving to politics and international relations in the fall. My job in African studies will be coming up, if yeah. anyone's looking. Thanks. Oh, and second one. What do you think of BBC Pigeon? What do I think of BBC? Pigeon. Whoa, that's a left of field one. <laughs> um, I personally hate it but I, uh, I await correction from people who know better about that particular linguistic repertoire. Hi, uh, I'm Jenny, uh, I'm a journalism scholar, um, and I think this uh, was a fascinating presentation, thank you. Uh, Especially uh, the f finale with moral economies, I think it's a very interesting approach uh, because, uh, I mean, the moral economy uh, concept of trying to identify those relations. Uh, but I wonder, in your analysis, I, I, I understand you have focused on a specific kind of relations between NGOs and journalists, but initially you talked about other actors as well like uh, corporations and, and, uh, and politics and so on. And have you been able to, I mean, just while doing this, incorporate that into those networks? Because it's also, it's moral, but as you said, it's also p political and economical. And how yep. do that sort of overlap? Yep. I think the, the, the Kenyan case was the most obvious one where that was the case, um, because so much of what was going on was being driven by um, commercial marketing in a situation where Safaricom, ooh, that's interesting, <laughs> I haven't had one of these before, um, was looking to regain its brand reputation uh, following a scandal that went globally, uh, including to the Kenyan parliament and, uh, and, and to the UK series fraud office. Um, so I'd be interesting to see how often corporate social responsibility programs are set up in the wake of that kind of situation. Uh, maybe I'm just really cynical. Um, but what was really interesting to me, there's, there's a whole chapter about that in the book, was the way in which the entire marketing campaign was based around trying to create a social media storm. And then that became the news story. So the marketing experts who were mainly casualized, there's that word again, expats, who'd been laid off during um, the global economic crisis around 2009 and had gone to Kenya as the next frontier of marketing, mm 
with a lot of emerging markets, they were looking to prove themselves as innovative thinkers, to brand themselves as innovative thinkers in a difficult global market. So that's why they were doing pro bono for free work with NGOs, because they weren't tightly tied the way you would be with a commercial contract to a particular client. And actually, they, they pretty much took over that entire process. There were objections from the Kenyan NGO, which they overruled. So that there's an interesting dynamic there that you can't separate the non-governmental -gover organizations and the news organizations from commercial organizations. What you're looking at is how the exchanges between all of them work and between social media participants, which was then picked up by international journalists. Oh, look, what's trending on Twitter? What's this? Oh, look, it's Africans and mobile phones. You know, got to be good, right? Um, so there was, that's really interesting. I mean, I did a different presentation based on the business side of that to, to Copenhagen Business School a couple of weeks ago. Um, so that's very much part of it. And I think it's really interesting that most of the northern journalists I spoke to were convinced that if they used material from a small sub-Saharan NGO, that that would somehow be more progressive than using it from, say, the children, Oxfam, so on. Um, they didn't really question how come this small sub-Saharan NGO has industry standard footage at its disposal. How, how's that happened? Whose expertise are they using and, and what do those other actors get out of it? I just want to bring in a question from Helen. Um, she said, um, so the bring, uh, Brings Egg Home campaign, could cases of simplistic positive stories then avert serious efforts to resolve social issues? And how can you, how can you address that? I think the simple answer is yes. <laughs> yes, they can. I think there's a, a real danger that in seeking to get away from negative stereotypes, rescue narratives, journalists are simply flipping the coin. They're not really doing something different. You know, Afro-optimism is just the other side of the coin from Afro pessimism. It's not doing something radically different. It's still using stereotypes, this time positive stereotypes. It's still generalizing about Africa. It's still not looking at complex cause and effect. Uh, yes, what can be done about it? Yeah, not sure I have the answer to that one. Sorry. I'm actually taking this opportunity and sort of asking, asking a question myself. I mean, one, one thing I always find fascinating, or no, it's not fascinating. I mean, what I find difficult to understand is sort of how big of a market we are looking at. Because in some ways, for us, humanitarian and development news is, is you know, what we do and we talk about and we research about. But obviously, compared to everything else, it's, it is sort of, it is very, very small fish in terms of what's newsworthy. I mean, I, I, I just read uh, uh, Olivier van Bemen's book on Heineken in Africa, where he looked sort of over time for the last 50 years how Heineken has been working in Africa. What he found was in most countries there are no advertising standards. Uh, journalists attend the Heineken-sponsored beer forum and write articles that basically praise the health virtues of Heineken beer. Um, so, but this is obviously also done on a, on, a, on a much, I mean, that's where some of the real money is. And to me, humanitarian news is kind of, is there a market for humanitarian news? Well, which markets are we talking about? Are we talking about sub-Saharan markets or are we talking about northern news markets? Well, I think, Mark, I mean, especially for, for sub-Saharan journalists or, or freelancers, like what, what, what percentage is, can they actually dedicate to... I think that's a really good question. I mean, it's something we've started looking at some more with the Humanitarian Journalism Project, which maps humanitarian journalism globally. And there's a couple of things I'm starting to find mm. that humanitarian journalism um, is in danger of becoming a political football because the organizations which do regular original reporting on humanitarian issues are predominantly states. And China is a really big one of them. And it's part of China's push to do positive coverage of Africa, to do humanitarian journalism or development journalism in a particularly constructive, one might say, way. 
Uh, for example, Xinhua now offers free copy to local slash national African journalists. And that's, that's having quite a lot of pickup. We also came across instances where journalists um, were having training days and doing coverage with NGOs in return for training days, and they didn't perceive themselves as taking a bribe or taking any kind of incentive. So there are all sorts of difficulties. At the same time, I want to highlight that it was the Kenyan Standard, which is the only newspaper that went back to that story. So when we talk about African journalism, again, we haven't got to generalize too much. There are some very cash poor outlets which are becoming quite dominated by states, also potentially by NGOs, private foundations. But there are also some fantastic journalism going on, so I don't want to overgeneralize too much. In the global north, horrible generalizing phrase, um, there are different things going on. So in the last two years, since we started the Humanitarian Journalism Project, there's a lot of news organizations that are now tagging their content as humanitarian. And I wish they'd done it to start with, because a self-description would have made my methodology <laughs> so much easier. But they're doing that for lots of different reasons. Um, there are public service imperatives there. You know, There are public service organizations which, at a time of UGC, at a time when many organizations are producing their own media content, are struggling to define what is the public good that we are doing. So doing humanitarian journalism in that circumstance fulfills a particular organizational purpose. Um, Chinese organizations I've mentioned, Qatar. Qatar is really interesting. Al Jazeera, the voice of the voiceless, the voice from the global south. You really have to ask yourself what an authoritarian state like Qatar is getting out of that kind of branding, um, particularly given that it has a longstanding military alliance with the US and a habit of um, being involved in diplomatic games, which are very, very complex and often quite underhand. So there are lots of interests circling around this. And the difficulty with both humanitarianism and development is that neither of them are particularly stable or fixed concepts, right? They're, they're multivalent. We don't agree about what they are. And that actually makes them quite easy to dominate by powerful actors. I guess the last one we should mention is, is private foundations. Yeah. Um, who have their own interests, which aren't entirely evil, but might be mixed about the kinds of discourses about development that they wish to shape. I don't know, that's quite a long answer. Is it, <laughs> I don't know if that but is, your it, is, it, is it fair to say that at the end of the day, humanitarian content pretty much needs to be subsidized one way or another? That's the difficulty. It does need to be subsidized one way or another because it's extremely expensive. You know, having that specialized knowledge of processes and institutions and specific country contexts, that does not come overnight. That's something you get probably after about a decade of studying, working in that area. So it does need to be subsidized. But at the same time, who has an interest in subsidizing it? And what's their game plan? There isn't a right answer. So Stana highlights sort of three very different um, media models. So she's asking, um, Kate, uh, would you say that Chinese media uh, are more objective than Western media and global issues coverage? Al Jazeera and also Russia Today have development and humanitarian issues related to documentaries about Africa and other regions. So what is your opinion on their coverage, which I think is probably three very problematic state Okay, news I'll, I'll go state by state. <laughs> okay, so in the Humanitarian Journalism Project, not for the book, but in the Humanitarian Journalism Project, uh, I worked within Xinhua and CGTN, used to be called CCTV. I suspect someone had a word with them about that particular branding. Um, it's different, it's very different. I mean, the philosophy of humanitarianism in China is profoundly different to US and UK models, um, and I'm using the plural there deliberately because there isn't one model. Uh, in Chinese thinking, we don't have so much the cosmopolitan model, 
of I as an individual have a responsibility to you as an individual, moral equivalence, because we are both human beings and we're both equally worthy and our need is equally important. That model doesn't compute in China. Um, it's much more of a concentric circles of responsibility model where your responsibility morally as a Chinese person is primarily to your countrymen, then to your neighbors in the Asia Pacific region, then to your trading partners or other allies and so on. Because from a Chinese perspective, if I can say something as simplistic as a single Chinese perspective, um, one cannot be equally responsible for everyone in the world. That makes no sense. How could you possibly be equally responsible for everyone? You must select in order to act. So that is the way that model of responsibility works. So I wouldn't say objective. Uh, I would say philosophically it's fundamentally different. It is also modeled on ideas of role taking, of the Chinese role in the world as being a bringer of global harmony and a bringer of global order, uh, a friend in opposition to the imperialist discourse of the West. So there's always a political motive there, uh, that it's about building alliances in opposition to the West, which is one of the reasons why the Chinese government doesn't um, have conditionality on aid in opposition to the West. I'm not treating you like a puppet like the West. However, there were those philosophical traditions. There's also what's currently going on in, uh, in the Chinese government. Uh, at this point, I ask whether this is freely available to everyone or whether it's password protected. Can anyone see this, or is it password um, protected? Well, if, if it's on the Facebook page, yes. Um, we will probably keep it in, in, the, in the archive. OK. Um, then I'll choose my words carefully. Um, Hu Jintao, the previous premier in China, had um, a different approach to the media to the current premier. The current premier is, takes a far more centralized, far more directive approach to the media which includes increased censorship and editorial intervention. And most of the journalists I spoke with at Xinhua and CGTN were looking for other jobs. They were not happy. So um, no, I wouldn't say it's objective. It's different at its best. It's more constructive. And it is different, which I think in itself can be useful. Um, but I wouldn't say it's more objective at all. Um, sorry, I, I, the page has jumped. Yeah. And I wanted to get back to the, the other question. Um, so, Stella says... It's about RT. Yeah. Uh, Al Jazeera and Russia Today have development and humanitarian issues related documentaries about Africa and other regions. What is your opinion of their coverage? Right, OK. Well, I wouldn't put Al Jazeera and RT together in the same sentence, usually. Uh, RT, if we think China is becoming more controlled, um, RT is at the far end of that scale, uh, or at least is perceived to be by other international journalists that I spoke with. So it was very common even for journalists to talk to me at length in Xinhua about the censorship problems they were having, uh, and then to say, yeah, but at least we're not RT. Um, so RT is treated as the other. RT is treated as the far end of the scale. I haven't studied RT, so the extent to which that is or is not fair, I cannot judge. I know that it has that reputation. Um, Al Jazeera, I would not put in the same brackets as either. Although uh, Qatar has interests uh, in being associated with Al Jazeera English, uh, interests which have actually backfired quite badly recently with the embargo on Qatar, there were far fewer occasions when Al Jazeera journalists said to me, that they were not able to pursue particular stories for political reasons. There were occasions when this happened, but there were far fewer. Um, and I didn't research in the documentary area in Al Jazeera, but usually documentaries are given more discretion than news. News is supervised a little bit more carefully. Um, Rebecca is also pointing out an interesting uh, aspect here. She says, I, I work a lot uh, with Liberian news outlets, um, Front Page Africa, Liberian Observer. And it's very interesting how the West does not refer to any of these very important news outlets, especially when the story is directly connected to the country in question. 
I can think about the upcoming trial of uh, Agnes Taylor, wife of Walter Charles Taylor, which will happen in the UK. UK news have barely reported on it, and when they did, they did not refer to any Liberian news outlets. In the same way that African outlets are dismissed by Western ones, I'm wondering if there's any academic study that researches about Africa's representation of Africa. Wow. Um, first of all, good for you. Um, I think one of the things that's going on is that I, I was saying earlier the amount of time that northern journalists have is shrinking. So what used to be a normal reading time for me was an hour, an hour and a half on the African Bulletin Desk at BBC World Service. I gather from my colleagues at BBC World Service and at our other outlets that that is regarded as a luxury uh, whose time has passed. Um, because if you're thinking about a reading, what are you doing at that point? You're not only actually reading, but you're trying to verify what you have read. Uh, you can't simply parrot what another news outlet says without testing it. Um, so if you don't have time to test it and make sure that it is correct, you don't use it. So I think that's one of the issues that you're finding. Um, so there was a second part to that question. Can you just remind me? Yes, the, um, whether there's research on Africa's representation of Africa, sort of how, how African journalists themselves represent Africa. Yeah, um, there is a journal dedicated to this called African Journalism. It used to be called Equid Novi, um, which is full of that stuff, and it's brilliant. Good. I mean, one, one thing I'm also thinking of is, I mean, you were talking a little bit more I mean, still about fairly traditional media. I mean, we haven't really gone into kind of what's Facebook or WhatsApp, like what are new new platforms doing to journalists? I mean, right now we have the elections in India, and there's a, the same question as how much fake news or false news or what you know whatever label you want to put on it is no longer actually just distributed by news outlets, by news websites or TV news channels, but actually through completely different channels, and are often sort of with very sort of detrimental impact. So I think that's that's also an interesting way of what we may perceive as journalism now is, is even not just moving to the internet, but is also kind of moving away from, from websites and other channels to um, yeah, videos shared on, on TikTok or, or, or WhatsApp. I think it's absolutely true. I mean, I didn't um, specifically focus on social media in the monograph. Um, what I did find was that journalists were repeatedly saying that they were using NGO content rather than social media. Yeah and rather than UGC, because they didn't have time to verify it. And they thought they could take the NGO content on trust, whereas they knew they would have to verify something which had arrived via a tweet or via WhatsApp. Great. I have one little yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, my name is Sara. I'm one of those freelance journalists you were talking about. <laughs> and I recognize a lot of what you are uh, saying about that uh, dependency co between NGOs and ourselves. Uh, I'm a writer, and I don't work for NGOs, but a lot of my photographer colleagues do. Yeah. And I've come across as something I find problematic is that most writers have a journalistic education, whereas the freelance photographers are usually more kind of, they don't have a journalism degree. They have more like a visual storytelling. And I think, uh, do you find that could be problematic? That it's usually those pictures that are kind of distributed, they don't have that sort of, um, uh, I, I don't know what, I'm, what the word I'm looking for, but it, it, the sort of context that maybe a, um, a writer would have in selecting what sort of picture should be um, representing the story, for example. Of the photojournalists I spoke with, only one had not begun by working for a newspaper. Um, there may be many more out there, um, but of the ones that I found, they had had a journalistic training and, and or had been staff um, and had got to the point when they either had been made redundant or had chosen to take voluntary redundancy because they were no longer able to do the kinds of work that were meaningful to them. 
And one of the reasons why journalists liked taking their work was because they thought that they shared similar ethics. So not touching up pictures, uh, not um, distributing misleading pictures with certain things cropped out, and so on. And that was one of the reasons why they felt that they could trust this, that there was a sense that these people, uh, there was a safeguard there. So if you are getting people in uh, who have that storytelling background but don't subscribe to those ethics, um, then yes, you would have a problem. There was one other person who popped up in my pilot, um, but I didn't find any, anyone like him in my main sample, who was doing pro bono work for an NGO, pro bono for, for free work for, uh, and he was actually a fashion photographer. And he did work for um, wildlife and environmental um, NGOs, and he had no problem with touching something up to make it look more striking. So then we do have to start to come into what are the ethical norms of this photograph. Um, but mainly I found that the people in this study were or at least had been journalists, even though many of them chose to no longer describe themselves in that way. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. It was actually <clears throat> quite brilliant and um, inspiring as well. I have mixed feelings here because I have different hats. I've been a former journalist also working for the UN for more than a decade. I've been working in Africa for a long time, training journalists, and also assisting uh, governments to um, work with the media in a more fluent manner, if that can be possible in the continent. And I have some issues to understand or to accept, as a former journalist, this um, positive reporting. I sat with more than 30 administrations in the African continent. All of them have issues with the media. They always report that the media is, you know, portraying the negative stories of the African continent, damaging our image uh, in front of the global public um, opinion, and also reducing <laughs> our investment possibilities and so far. And that negative uh, stories are also used as a way to control their own media. So local media are actually suffering from the same. So not only correspondents and uh, international media working in the African continent are suffering from this uh, demonization, I could say, of the media, but also local media and national media, regional media as well in the African continent. So I'm not really in favor of this positive portraying of the news um, as a former journalist. And then it is true that always the image about Africa is negative. Um, how can we cover the African continent news without portraying this negative influence? For example, if I'm covering um, the fashion industry in the continent, how can I um, avoid the, what is happening in that particular country, like for example in Mali or in Ghana or you know, these countries in which fashion is really growing up. Um, that's my, my first question, like how can we put the balance like? I, I'm just gonna agree. Um, I think that the term positive journalist or positive reporting or positive news story, it's so vague as to be virtually meaningless. And, and things that are so vague as to be virtually virtually meaningless, lay themselves open to capture by elites uh, and manipulation by elites. So it's, very, it's a very easy slide from saying, yes, we need more positive news stories into what you're describing as sunshine journalism, which is we must never be critical. We must be respectful of those in authority. We must be constructive, which is a, a great way of controlling local journalists. Exactly. Um, and I think that there's a fundamental thing here, which is most news is negative. Negativity is a news value. That's not just an African thing. That is a British thing, a Swedish thing, uh, a Latin American thing. And I would love someone to do a systematic study over a period of time comparing, let's say, Southeast Asia, Africa, Latin America. Because I, I do not know, and we still do not know, 
is news about Africa more negative? Yeah. And even if it is, there are questions there which you're raising about truth, you know, truth telling, um, which is a fundamental value in, in, in journalism. And, and we can be critical of that, and we can deconstruct truth, and we can say who's truth. But ultimately, it, it's, it's, there is something deeply problematic about pursuing a news agenda that is at odds with the country that you're in. And there are uplifting stories. Um, but I think it was really interesting that the one major rebellion that I came across in the Humanitarian Journalism Project was from the CGTN newsroom, one of the Chinese newsrooms in Nairobi, where the Chinese government had recently, under the current premiership, instituted a new editorial policy at that. Um, every news bulletin had to be led by a positive news story. And um, after a period, all the journalists said, you know what, we're not doing this which is almost unheard of for a Chinese news outlet, for the journalists to turn around and go, do you know what, no. Because the person leading the charge was the war correspondent. After her, number two had been a refugee for the Rwandan genocide. So there was a strong push back to say, actually, as Africans, we find it offensive. We don't, we don't think this is a improving relations between China and Africa. We think this is, this is insulting. This is not what's happening. This is not true. And also, there is a... You know, there's a field logic there whereby all journalists don't stay in their organizations. Even if you do have a staff job, you know, you're looking for your career. You're looking for where you might want to move next. A lot of um, local national journalists um, might get their first international broadcasting job at a Chinese news organization. Most of them are looking to move on pretty quickly after that. And they don't want to damage their own reputations too much. You know, if you're a CGTN reporter and you want to move to the BBC or you want to move to Al Jazeera, you cannot be seen on camera beginning with your news bulletin with a piece about a flower farm when there's an explosion, which everyone else is reporting on. You look like an idiot. Or you at least look completely out of kilter with the rest of the journalistic field. So journalists can and do push back against that, although it's quite rare. Yeah, I have a second question. I would like to know what is your opinion, because I, I prefer to talk instead of positive reporting about professional reporting that includes negative and positive angles of the news. And what is your opinion about the last efforts towards media development in the African continent? Now we see a lot of projects from Internews, BBC Media Action, uh, IMS, even EU-funded projects going from the Arab region to the African continent. Do you see that evolution? And what is your opinion about the efforts to um, enhance the professionalism of African journalism? Thank you so much. So what is my opinion of media development organizations? OK, well, I think Martin had it right when he said that, what does media development even mean? You know, what do we mean by media development? And there is a, a question mark in my mind about the extent to which news organizations from the US often um, are trying to export their model of journalism. I have a fundamental question about that in terms of ethnocentricity, but also in terms of financial sustainability, because the US model in particular relies on a big advertising stream. You know, that's not even working in the US. Why do you think that's going to work in, in Angola? Um, so there's I think there's such a thing as setting people up to fail financially. Um, there's some really good work being done from CIMA, C-I-M-A, yeah. in Colombia. Anya Schifrin does a lot of work on that, which is really interesting. It's not been my area of work much. There is one case study in the book on Internews, which is, may, may interest you for that reason. I think Internews is a bit different, though, because they, they've sort of started off arguing that they were providing media for humanitarian reasons, you know, information as a human right or information as a humanitarian aid. And now they're moving more towards discourse about sustain uh, sustainability and development. Um, but again, here you're seeing really blurry boundaries because uh, with Intranews, what they were finding was that the funding cycles are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. So what you used to do is have a, like say, let's say a five-year window. And you do your baseline study, and then you do your staged evaluations every year, and you maybe start planning for sustainability around year three, and then gradually pulling back. 
But because funding cycles are now down to six months, they can't do that anymore. And it takes me three months to just withdraw from a field. You have to give three months to give staff their notice or to close down an office, right? So how are they going to do those kinds of evaluations? So what I've found that internews are doing, and they're not alone in this, a lot of media development organizations are doing, is they're bringing in freelancers. Rather than doing full project reports, which tell me, did that project work or not, they're making a nice video, they're doing virtual reality, they're doing a really pretty series of pictures as an exhibition. Uh, and the discourse around this is fascinating because a lot of it that they were telling me was big donor, and we're talking big donors here, we're talking the State Department, we're talking USAID, we're not talking some tin pot philanthropist. Uh, they don't read my project evaluations, but they come out of an exhibition or a film showing and say they feel really good. They feel loved was the phrase. And I think that that's fascinating, that affective, the creep of the affective into project evaluations, because that fuzzy, fuzzy feeling, that's all about me as a donor. That's essentially narcissistic. That tells me, did this appeal to me? Did this make me feel good? It doesn't tell me, was that effective for the people in question? So although I haven't done a whole book on media development organizations, this is just a chapter, I think there's some stuff going on there about the way in which that world is relating relating to freelancers as well. Because the use of freelance media producers to do a form of project reporting, and then of course those freelancers have to make rent, so they go on and sell that material into the news organizations as well. So something is turning up as a news story, which was actually produced to tell donors how great a project was. That's all kinds of ways problematic. Positive note. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, that's very depressing for a Friday afternoon. I have some references here if you want them as well. Okay, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for um, having me. We had a great time. I think uh, we had a good audience. Um, we have about 25 students online on Zoom, and uh, at some point, about uh, 15 people on the stream on Facebook, in addition to the 30 people here in the room. So we did good. We reached a nice audience. Um, thanks for joining. Um, Hugo, do you want to say a few things to the students um, about tomorrow, or...? I, I think we're, for Comdo students, we're going to have another quick session after yep. this just to wrap up and, and perhaps just reflect a little bit on Kate's presentation and how it relates to our course and, and, um, and then just look ahead to tomorrow. So perhaps we just take like a ten minute break and then just, not for a long session, but we just be good to come back together and just kind of wrap up before we all head off. Thanks. Thank you.